Hi and welcome to this week's episode. I'm here today with the incredible Becky Brightman, who is a mum. She's also a sleep consultant. She's one of our sleep nanny franchisees. And Becky has joined me today because we want to discuss the all important topic of what sleep training even is, what it even means, and how confusing it can be for so many parents out there. So welcome Becky to the show. Hi Lucy, thank you for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. I can't wait to delve into this with you. So Becky, yeah, do you want to just introduce yourself a little bit more, tell everybody who you are, um, and what brought you here and then we'll yeah we'll delve in yeah i can do that hi Be- hi everybody my name is becky i live in milton Keynes with my husband and my daughter amelia who is going to be turning five in just a couple of weeks which is crazy um before i became a mum or a sleep coach i was a primary school teacher um and so i had a lot of experience with um school age children I was a teacher for about eight years when I had Amelia, uh, or was it nine years? And then I did a year or two of teaching after she was born. Um, And it was during those final years of teaching and the first couple of years of parenthood where I really discovered what it means to be truly sleep deprived. Um, Amelia was about 18 months old when we eventually sleep trained her and the reason I say eventually is because I was against it for a long time funnily enough Um, yeah you definitely had some ideas didn't you that made you think that this isn't I'm not going to sleep train my child this is something yeah negative right absolutely and I I think I had that um prejudice against sleep training for two reasons. The first was having been trained as a teacher for so many years. Anyone who works with children will know that you have to go through yearly, um, quite intensive safeguarding training, um, as well as all of the pastoral care and you know the, the training that you have to have to, to look after a child. Um, you learn a lot um, about different kinds of harm that children can come to you learn a lot about attachment and about brain development and child development generally and part and parcel of that is hearing a lot of really really sad stories about um, really unfortunate things that happen to really unfortunate children so I very much had that um, kind of influencing my ignorance I will say ignorance because it was ignorance um the other side of it was the pressures that I think we almost subliminally receive from society around us especially westernized countries um I think there's a lot of pressure on mums to do things perfectly And I think just like with anything, you soon learn when you become a mum that you can't please everybody. And actually, I think everyone goes through that moment as a mother where they go, do you know what? I don't need to please everybody. I just need to do what's right for me and my family. Um, So that's what eventually led me to, at the time, go against my better judgment, which is what it was at the time, go against my instinct. Sleep, work with a coach to sleep train Amelia. I would, I would never have seen it through if I'd done it by myself. Um, and that was the turning point. That mm. was the magic moment that changed everything. So, just tell us a bit about why. Why did you think I'm not going to do that? Like, I understand that obviously there's the things that you learned as a teacher and so on. But for you, because there'll be parents listening who are in that camp right now you know in Mm. that headspace of i'm not i I wouldn't do that or or maybe they're unsure and that's why they're here and they're listening to this but to relate to those parents like what what were the thoughts you were having what were your fears or concerns that made you feel like it wasn't something for you initially 
I think it was a combination of the things you hear and are told about what is good and bad for a baby. Mm. And as a first time mum in 2019, which it was then when Amelia was born, um, and even the, the things, the pressures that mums have to, had then on them are, are the same now. It was less than five years mm. ago. Um, it was all about, you shouldn't do this because. So you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't formula feed or you should breastfeed rather because it's better for baby or you should do loads of skin to skin and you should bed share. Oh, but you shouldn't do it unsafely you can only do it safely it's all very confusing isn't yeah. it like a lot of pressure a lot of pressure and everyone's got their opinion so where some people are saying breast is best others say formula is better for some people others say fed is best nobody really knows what the answer is because it's all it's all coming from somebody's opinion mm -hmm. and as a mum when you're already exhausted and terrified and just trying to do the best by this little person who is relying on you for literally everything, all you want to do is your best and to do the right things. So when you already know about attachment theory, um, you you go back to what, what you know, because at least that's fact. To, to hear about, to learn about safeguarding and attachment in the context of professional development training, that feels like safer information to rely on than what society says. Because as, as you know, as I've just said, where one group say one thing's okay, the other group will say, no, it isn't. And, you know, you never know who's right or who's wrong. But mm. the flaw to this plan was that Yes, I learned loads about how to keep children safe and loads about attachment theory, which is great. But I learned it in the context of literally the worst case scenario. I learned it in the context of how to protect, protect a child who is already going through that or how to identify when a child is being neglected or suffering from abuse. Mm -hmm. And I mean... The sad stories, you know, uh, I'm not going to name them, but there are lots of news stories that this country will be familiar with over even the last 20 years. Um, we still know the names of the children who made the news. Um, I mean, as a teacher, you hear, you're reminded of those stories every every year. Um, and none of it is... But, oh, but this is how you parent and this is how it's different for parents. Obviously, that's not relevant for the training. And the most shocking, I think, is when you're shown brain scans, um, different brain scans from different three-year-olds, one who's had a completely healthy um, attachment with, it, with its parents as it's grown, and then a brain scan of a three-year-old who hasn't. And the physical, structural abnormalities and differences in the neglected three-year-old brain once you see that you never unsee it that mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. really really um horrifying yeah I bet. and so yeah. and yeah so that's the stuff you remember and that's the stuff you cling on to um coupled with oh i'm just gonna do what everyone else does as well because i don't know what i'm doing so I'm fascinated to learn because you, you, what you've shared there is so important. And there are, I mean, we see it in all kinds of other areas of not just neglect, but other things that impact the brain from what we consume to tech and media and gaming and all these other things that affect how the brain is impacted. If you're a parent who has seen those kinds of things and you're like well yes exactly like you're there you're looking at that and you're like well I want to make sure my child has the healthiest possible attachment I do not want that stuff happening to my child now to the average person it would seem like well I'm not going to ignore anything they ever do I'm going to be 100% attentive and the ideas and some of the things that are 
um, I, I will say, unintelligently, bouted about without any real backing, um, could really frighten a parent from working on improving sleep. And I'm saying mm. that deliberately because sleep training can, it, it, it's a, like most labels, conjure up all kinds of different things. And there are so many different varieties of everything. So, but actually working on, working on even any kind of um, intentional effort to make sleep better is eliminated from a parent's mind because they're like, oh no, can't go anywhere near doing that because it's going to somehow leave that effect on their brain. And and I know that's where you were. That's sort of what you were thinking. So mm. what changed that? Like what made you go from feeling that way, knowing the scientific facts to seeing things differently or seeing that those scientific facts perhaps weren't applicable because they're not about what we're talking about. They're about mm. total mm. neglect, true neglect. Yeah. Well, I don't think I learned that particular lesson until we'd actually begun. Mm hmm. Sure. OK, fair enough. And and I think that I reached a level that a lot of people, a lot of parents sadly do reach before they eventually um, consent to going down a pathway. They didn't ever really see themselves going down. Mm -hmm. For me, it wasn't about me. It wasn't about how tired I was, although I was very, mm -hmm. very tired. Um, it wasn't about how much Amelia's waking and night feeding and all the rest of it. It wasn't about what impact that had on me. As long as it was right for her, I was prepared to do that. And then came the really difficult realization of actually this isn't actually working for her if I could say oh well you know she wakes up every now and again for for a feed but it's fine because I know she genuinely needs it because it's only once in a while and actually the rest of the time she's sleeping really really well she's really happy all the time she's developing well she doesn't get ill that much you know she's not grumpy in the day um, it doesn't affect anything like her appetite. You know, it's just one of those things that she does every now and again. But I know she's getting the right amount of sleep. So, you know, it's worth it. It wasn't worth it because she wasn't falling under that category. She wasn't well rested. She was waking up, upset, being fed and was still awake. Because it wasn't hunger that had woken her up in the first place which I didn't know, and it didn't help that we'd had feeding issues with her when she was born anyway. So for me, crying was triggering and that equaled hunger. And I've got to feed my baby because she's starving, which obviously she wasn't because she was 18 months old. But it took me right back to those early days where she was because we were, um, we were really struggling with that and unfortunately had been given some bad advice, which um, I think scarred me a little bit from seeking other advice too. But... Um, once I eventually I had to admit to myself, I've done everything right. I've done everything people tell you you should do. I've done everything that my all my safeguarding training has ever told me I should do, which is to respond to her immediately every time she cries. Um, I literally do whatever is required of me to get that crying to stop. She has no needs as far as I can make out, other than to sleep better. I've met all the other needs, but she isn't. She still isn't happy. She's always poorly. Her appetite's not great. She's grumpy in the day all the time. She is very, very tired and dark under her eyes. She's falling asleep all the time in the car, but I cannot get her to sleep in her own, in her own cot. She doesn't even sleep when she comes into bed with me and my husband because she's just crawling around and, and playing. You know, none of it was sitting well with me. And it was it was it was hard. It's hard to get to that place as a mum to go, I've done everything right. I've listened to what everyone has said. I haven't I haven't let her cry. You know, I've given her whatever I, she's needed at any time, yet she is not getting the sleep she needs. So now that has to be the priority. Because 
because actually that is now the need that's being sabotaged yeah. by everything else and you spotted that and i like that that you actually saw well hold on she needs to be getting more sleep this isn't healthy this isn't right yeah. and I, yeah. i'm guessing was there a sense of like what am i missing like what i'm you know i'm i'm doing all the things like what am i missing i think it was as it so often is and don't tell him i said this lucy because he'll never let me hear the <laughs> end of it but my my husband is often the voice of reason who speaks out in those really dark moments of maybe it's time we we think about this or maybe it's time we turn our attention to the actual issue here um and we've had a few of those conversations during the course of our relationship but one of one of the ones that really sticks out in my head is uh just a standard evening of me coming downstairs in a towering temper and tears of rage pouring down my face because I'd gone upstairs with Amelia at six o'clock with the intention of getting her to bed early because I'd I recognized that she was really tired and I wanted her to go to sleep early yet I hadn't escaped her bedroom until 10 p.m I had mm. been up there for four hours mm. I was due at school the next day to teach I was not planned for the next day so my my work evening hadn't begun so I had all of that ahead of me and I just came down in tears so frustrated and sadly so resentful of her because but it wasn't her fault but of course yeah. when you're like you're irrationally tired and yeah, so grumpy and frustrated yeah. and all I could do was sit in her room waiting for her to fall asleep thinking about all the work I wasn't doing that I needed to do and I was really cross and upset about it and Adam said look I think it's time to look at the sleep because right now the way you know you've done amazing and you've done all the right things but clearly something's not right for her yet and it isn't right for you either look at yourself this is not okay this is not healthy yeah. you know how for, can, for either. either of you for <laughs> either of you he said how can you be the mum you want to be when this is how you're feeling day to day mm. and that really struck home because mm -hmm. I thought oh he's right I'm killing myself trying to be the perfect mum mm -hmm. and I'm There's failing so many of us and, I'm, and I'm mm. failing not because anyway. I'm a bad mum <laughs> I'm failing because I'm holding myself to account against an unrealistic expectation and I'm expecting way too much from myself so yes I need to do this for her but actually I need to do this for me which in return will benefit her anyway because Adam said to Adam said to me would Amelia be happier with a perfect mum or a happy mum love that and he mm. said you can't be both mm. and I was like okay all right yes you're right mm. thank you yeah and yeah, that's how it that's began really, mm. so fast forward to you went to you reached out and got some advice with with sleep and that's where then the whole next level of education began for you because as a teacher ever the learner you absorbed all of the um understanding of like mm. okay this is why she she does this and this is this is what i'm doing and this is what i'm doing with all the best intention that maybe isn't helping things, but that, you know, and you, you've got a whole new understanding of it all. Am I right? And that's yes. why your views changed. Yes. I think crucially, I found the right person mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to help me. Yeah, because, that's really cause, key. Because you, oh, you know her as well. And the sleep coach I found was trained by Lucy um, had been a teacher previously spoke your language <laughs> she spoke my language she was I found her by chance she I read a review from a Facebook friend who and that she'd shared it on Facebook mm -hmm. and I read it and it was saying things like we didn't have to leave our daughter to cry and but she's now sleeping so well and we feel so supported and we were able to do it in a way that we felt comfortable with and we did it gently and I remember reading it going 
that's a choice. That's a thing. <laughs> I didn't know it could look like that. So I navigated myself to the website of the sleep coach who had written the Just blog. Just before, you, what, what did you think it looked like then? Well, I thought it looked like the Ferber method. Right. Which I think a lot, that's what a lot of parents think. And in fact... You thought you would have to leave her to cry or not yeah. respond or yeah. it would affect the attachment, like all the classic yeah. Yeah, things absolutely. that you thought would the, create... Mm -hmm, yeah basically mm. my thing was she's gonna have to she's gonna fall asleep in her room on her own having sobbed her heart out until the point where she can't stay awake anymore and she isn't going to learn how to fall asleep what she's going to learn is that nobody's coming when she cries mm. and that mm. i could not allow yeah um but when i read this facebook review of oh no that that wasn't their experience at all and it wasn't just some randomer it was a person i knew it she was a yeah. friend of a friend you could our verify girls, it <laughs> our girls both attended the same little baby ballet class yeah so i did actually ask her about it as well and she was like 100 percent, don't hesitate just do it because this this lady in question was also a teaching assistant yeah so she also worked in that school context. So suddenly I had people in the same professional environment as me making that choice. And suddenly it mm. felt like, actually, this is a valid option for me because the people who I relate to, the people who I would kind of put myself within the same category as them, they're making this decision for themselves and they're doing it unapolog unapologetically and they're getting the results they deserve. Mm -hmm. So that's what we deserve then, you know? So yeah. the final cherry on the cake was getting to the website of the sleep coach and reading the blog she'd written about firework children. And my God, did, she, did she speak my language? She described my daughter. And I just read this and I came down and I came downstairs to Adam and I said, this is the lady I want. She gets us. She yeah. she gets Amelia, and that is all I care about. I need somebody yeah. who understands her. I need I don't know the where to start. Yeah, it, we need to get this right for her. Yeah, and this lady has the answer. This is who I want. I love that. And yeah. you know, I think the thing that you've something you've made me think about here is that yes there was a need and and you needed this help and so did Amelia like we whole family did like yes was the need but it's like actually now maybe at that point it was like I need to fix this but looking back on reflecting and 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 seeing now how other people come at this is it's it doesn't have to just be coming from a place of need and desperation um you know oh I'm oh I'm gonna have to do this oh you know like when we go and hire a personal trainer to get us help us get into better shape, it's not, oh, well, well, I'm just going to have to. It's like, no, actually, I want to because of the health benefits. And actually, now, would it be fair to say that it's not just about that need of fixing a problem? It's actually, actually, what about all of the positives and the health benefits that come, which we can get to in a minute, but... Um, I think that's important too because I know you know my story um we all have our stories but I since working in this industry have heard a lot worse stories than mine and I would say that sometimes it's it doesn't have to be a horrendous problem and you be in a state of desperation to go I'm gonna have to do this horrible thing because I'm desperate it's like what about you get to do this amazing thing that mm -hmm. can instill so much better health happiness and development for a child and I I, I think that's as you say, when you spoke to people that you felt understood your level of knowledge and intelligence around how the human brain works, how attachment works, how children work, you, you know, you had a above average parent knowledge on that because most of us don't know that much about those things when we become a parent. So, you know, you, you did because of what you did and who, who you worked around. Um, I really, I find it really amazing that you could, you know, that you were able to then add further knowledge to that, build upon that, see that, that it's way bigger and broader. It's not a single channel view here. There's so much, there's so much more to it. Um, so yeah, I think that would be really great to hear next. Like, 
um, what you then discovered about how, okay, this is what causes that on the brain, not this. Like, what are the differences yeah. that you then went, oh, like, this is different. Like, what, what, what's, yeah, what are they? So I, so I think, <clears throat> think the first thing I will say is mm. the sleep training we had with this sleep coach absolutely delivered everything that it had promised. Um, we did not leave Amelia in her room by herself to cry herself to sleep. Um, because we we didn't want to do that. But also, right, as our sleep coach said, that's not appropriate for her. She's not ready for that. Well, you know, we're not going to do that to her because she can't learn like that just now. That's not the solution. No, but she said in a week or two, that's exactly what she'll be ready for. And then that will be the appropriate step that we take with her. But she'll be ready for it by then. But right now we need, we need to do the groundwork to get her to the place where she's comfortable to have you coming in and out of the room and it's no big deal and i was comfortable with that yes fine as long as we're warming her up to get to that place fine but i'm not going to spring it on her and my and the sleep coach said no nor should you nor should you um <clears throat> by night three she slept through wow and i was just like what who is this child where's my daughter gone <coughs> excuse me um the girl who had woken up for at least three breastfeeds per night for the last year didn't because you knew she didn't need that's not what she was needing my, when she woke anyway so my mind hmm. was blown my mind was blown and the things that i learned when way beyond that though because that's mm. what led me onto the next part of that journey which was i'm going to do this for others i'm going to let people know that there is a way of helping sleep to improve in your home without breaking all your own rules as a parent without going and against mm. without going against your parenting values your parenting instincts your parenting yeah. style to some yeah. people <clears throat> their parenting style is really important to them mm. and it's really important to know that you can still implement change and be respectful of the boundaries that you have in place for your family it's really important that people know that that's possible yeah and you know i think coming back to what you said just now lucy about not waiting until it's a desperate desperate time mm -hmm. if there if i have one regret and it is only one i have only one regret about that entire experience it's that i didn't do it way sooner yeah. because actually we hear that so often as well so often parents. and i my sleep my sleep coach had to really coach me through this because the guilt i felt the morning after night three when she slept through and woke up and she was a different child i felt such shame and guilt and my but you sleep, hadn't got her there quicker and adam right. and my coach were like why are you punishing yourself for doing something so amazing for her? Yeah. And I said, because I made her wait so long. <laughs> and I realized the whole time it was me. I had been the barrier to Amelia getting healthy sleep. Through and no fault of your own. No like fault of parents, my own. That's the absolutely. Thing. It was not absolutely and all i did was my best for her and all i yeah. did was follow my instincts and you know i did what i felt was the right thing always but i think that it is hard when it transpires that actually in trying your best to do the right thing and you've actually not i think yeah i defy anyone to feel a little bit guilty about that however irrationally but once, once my eyes were opened to the magic and the value and the beauty and the power that comes from reclaiming healthy, not just a health, not just healthy sleep, but a healthy lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Because 
we were all over the show. I was too exhausted to do anything. I was too exhausted to eat properly. I was too exhausted to exercise. I was too exhausted for self for self care. I was just surviving. I was running on fumes. I really was. And the things that we could we could go out because I wasn't exhausted and terrified about her not sleeping and you know I could make plans. We could socialize. We went to a mum and baby keep fit class and you know the stuff that we hadn't done before and I almost didn't realize how much of a prison a lack of sleep had had created not just in my mind but actually in my body Mm -hmm. I was too tired and I was trapped in this fog of Mm -hmm. exhaustion And so many mothers, I think, believe that that's some kind of suffering they have to put themselves through for their children. It's like, oh, but I'll wear that badge of honour. I'll I'll give myself up for them. But it's not for them. It's not helping them. I'll martyr myself because that's what mums do. But no. how is that benefiting? And when you're, you know, when you are happy and healthy and vibrant, full of energy, you are going to, well, your child's going to pick up on that anyway, just sheer, like the, the energy of you, let alone the added benefits of how much more focus and attention and joy and all the other things that you can bring in that state. Yeah. So it's, it is crazy that for so long and I think it does go back generations and in, into history that we've almost adopted this belief that you know we have to suffer for them um which we we really really don't no I think there's something <clears throat> go on go on oh sorry I was just going to say I reflect now on harm I'm using mm-hmm. air yeah. quotes for people who are yeah. not seeing me um because harm was something I was always determined not to do, as we all are. We're all determined as parents not to cause harm. And before sleep, tra- I, look, I look at life now as before and after sleep training. Before sleep training, harm to me meant crying and abandonment and neglect and <clears throat> impacted attachment and brain development and, and all those things. After sleep training, the guilt and the shame, I think partly came, the the guilt and shame I experienced, I think partly came from reflecting on the benefits and the gains that the healthy sleep brought, not just to Amelia and her health, but also to me, particularly my mental health. And I look on it now, even today, and I think actually, she came arguably to more harm by me refusing to sleep train her because I was a angry parent. I was an impatient parent. I fully admit it. I got to the point where I was really resentful of being a parent because it was so much harder than I ever expected it was going to be. Um, And a lot of that came down to the sleep deprivation, a lot of it. And I was not the mum I had wanted to be. I was not the mum I had imagined that I would be. And I wasn't the mum I was capable of being. And Amelia was the one who suffered for that, in my opinion. And that's, you know, mm-hmm. that that's a very, very honest confession. Mm. But it's true. Mm. She, she came to more harm for me listening to what people around me said about the evils of sleep training and the the damage that comes from sleep training and you know the fear that I had and the avoidance that that caused by far was had more negative harm than anything else it certainly was far more harmful than any harm again I'm air quoting harm that she came from sleep training sleep training was only a positive experience for us even when she wasn't happy with changes and pushed back Mm-hmm. Well, that's just it because there's response like that. So, you know, not happy with this change, push back those kinds of things. Even as babies, they can go, I don't like this. This is different. And that is communicated by crying. And yeah. as they get a bit older, it might be a bit more tantrumy or a bit more shouty, even. But it's a response that says, This is different and I don't like it. 
I mean, goodness, you get that throughout childhood when there's a no to something that they really want a yes to. And that's normal. They're supposed to go, well, what if I do this? Will you change your mind? Well, what if I, you know, the, the classic supermarket analogy, no, you're not having those sweets at the checkout. Oh, they've stopped doing that now, but you know. Um, and it's like, well, if I have a screaming tantrum, maybe they'll, they'll get, now they're not thinking that. It's not that contrived, but it's natural human behavior to go, if I change my behavior, will you change yours? And yes. a child does that. They go, well, if I, if I try this behavior out, will I get a different outcome? And it's actually harder, but far more beneficial to the child if they see every time is met with the same response, a loving, caring, I'm here for you, I love you, but I'm not going to bend on this because this is the boundary and whatever it may be. Yeah. They quickly then go, oh, okay. But you know what? That creates trust. That creates, I can count on this person to mean what they say. I yes. know that this person's here for me. Okay, right now I'm not really liking that they're saying no to me, but at least I know where I stand. And, you know, the whole thing about secure attachment, not only is it to have that trust, to know that that person, you know, it's not, it, saying no doesn't mean you don't love them. <laughs> and, and actually being um, secure in that attachment is an ability to let go. It's an ability to say goodbye and they can go and you know they'll come back. You know, and they, they, yes, they learn that at various stages in child development. They call, you call it serve and return. But peekaboo, it's like, I'm gone. I'm here again, you know. And you learn gradually as object permanence becomes a thing. You learn that, oh, they do come back. Oh, they dropped me at nursery, but they do come back. Yeah. And the ability to say, yeah, bye, because I'll see you at the end of the day, because I know and I trust that this person is going to return for me. That is secure attachment. Mm-hmm. But it, secure attachment doesn't mean physically, continually, permanently attached. And like I a think, koala bear. <laughs> yeah. And, and parents, I mean, gosh, myself included, when I was first a parent, I had none of the knowledge I have now about the psychology, child development, none of the things that I've gone on to learn. And you just act on instinct, don't you? And when we're not all experts in these things, so we're, we're trusting the information that we're fed, but sadly we're fed so much mixed information. And now with social media and everyone's an expert, there's a lot of things that are said or shared that are a, a flippant comment without the depth and detail. And that's very frightening for parents. And, and it leaves you going, well, I don't know what to do, so I'll do nothing. And that's the worst for so many people when I see people go and drive their car with their kiddies in there and they're sleep deprived to a point that's worse than being over the limit on alcohol or drugs. Like that's, that's frightening and yeah. it happens every day. Yeah. And for what, like you said, no, it doesn't mean, oh yeah, well it's that or I have to leave them to cry. You don't even have to do that. The, leaving a child to cry and ignoring them, that's not sleep training. Sleep training is... Uh, in fact, you don't even have to use the term sleep training if you don't like it. But really, the way we define it is it's about deciding that you're going to take some form of um, intentional action to help a little one to develop and shape better sleep. Yeah. And that might mean because actually what I'm doing is I'm going in and trying to soothe them, but all I'm doing is riling them up. All right, well, let's change that. It might be because the timings are off. It might be a combination of things. It could be oh, there's so many things it could be. It doesn't mean to sleep train, I must say goodnight, leave the room and not come back Mm. or only come back now and again. Those are old fashioned ideas, but it's, that's not what it means. So I want to know what you would say to a parent who is feeling like that right now, that who was where you were or that feels frightened um, to do anything and feels kind of paralyzed by the confusing and conflicting information out there because that's what we are we're more of that information so Mm. why why is this information any any more helpful like what would you say to someone who's like in that bind i would i would say do you trust yourself as a parent and of course they're going to say yes well i hope so but there may be people that don't (laughs) Possibly, but I think (laughs) they trust in the decisions they make day to day for their child. They trust what they decide to feed 
their baby. They trust where how they dress their baby, where they take their baby. They trust who they who they entrust their child to when they need childcare support. Those fundamental choices that they make and they, they take those decisions every day, they trust them because if they didn't, they wouldn't make those decisions. Ultimately, <clears throat> that's what sleep training is. As you've said, it's intentionally making decisions on behalf of your child so that their needs are met. Mm -hmm. Whether that yeah. be food, clothing, whatever. Um, and it's really important to recognize when wants for things sabotage the needs of other things because a need is always going to trump a want in terms mm -hmm. of where it should be in the list of priorities and in the day-to-day -day life of any parent of an of a child under five the battle of wants versus needs is real and yeah. we have to we have to as parents every day we have to decide what things are worth our energy and what things we're not prepared to fight on brushing yeah. teeth i don't care how much you hate it you have to do it you know um yeah. having taking your inhaler as much as you don't like the experience of doing it yeah. you have asthma you need your inhaler or you need your medicine because you're ill you need your antibiotic or you know or your simple things like getting dressed getting dressed <laughs> oh my gosh lucy triggered yeah. <laughs> that's our battle every day is getting dressed um you know because but it's learning ways yeah, to help them to do the yeah. things that they need they need for life life skills yeah. things that they need so that they can operate and function in day-to-day -day life yeah um but and, I don't feel, yeah. I don't even just want to reach out to the parents who were at, who are in the place I was in. I want to reach out to all parents and say, this isn't something that you only embark on when there is a problem that needs to be fixed. 100% agree. Because health can always be better. Yeah. Could it be better? Could sleep be better? And it you is can right always now. you can always reflect on your lifestyle and on the lifestyle of your family. There is always something there that could mm -hmm. be better, that could be healthier. And I'm not mm -hmm. saying that everyone has to be perfect, because as we've learned, my my journey for perfection led me down a very very dark avenue. But still strive for what's great. Mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be perfect. But it deserves to be great and you deserve that. You deserve the experience of great health. Mm. And you can't achieve that without great sleep. Even if, even if your family is sleeping well and the sleep in your home is good, there's still room for improvement. Mm. Yeah. And even if you're the parent who is like, eh, it's fine. I, you know, well, they're probably not listening. They're probably not still with us right now. No, but you can not. share this with a friend who maybe is in that position where they're like, yeah, sleep's fine. Like we sleep fine. We get by. It's all good. Like it's not really a big problem. So they've not really thought of it. But actually, what are the the secret i see secret signs or the little things that maybe you don't see or that you know or, or that you haven't realized is sleep related like it could be an appetite thing it could be a, a nutrition thing it could be concentration in school if they're school age or it may be a social behavior uh thing that you're seeing and i mean it pains me when Oh, I mean, I know there are so many other things that it could be and there are behavioural disorders and concerns and conditions. But when somebody just starts trying to label or going down a diagnosis for some kind of behavioural condition, when it's like, this kid's just tired, <laughs> like, this child's just not actually getting enough sleep because maybe they're masking it because maybe they mm. appear to cope absolutely fine. Yeah, they go to sleep, they wake up, there's no hassle, there's no problem. Everyone seems happy. But there's this other niggle you've got going on that yeah maybe they're socially um having some challenges or you know i don't know and you're like oh that's that's and i've seen that i've spoken to parents where they've gone yeah sleep's fine and i've i've seen a, the toddler 
um, you know, crying all day, whinging, nagging, nagging at, at the parent whose whose attitude is, oh, they just sleep when they want. I'm like, that's the problem because I can see the state of your child, and they're not they're not in their their happiest, brightest, healthiest place to thrive. And they're an age where they're a sponge, and they could be soaking up everything, but they're not because they are absolutely shattered and miserable. It's so interesting when parents realize what you do or learn what you do as a sleep coach for the first time and you get one of two responses the first is oh my god I could have done with you two years ago yeah yeah and the second is oh well they're already a good sleeper so yeah yeah okay and you know what if it's not a problem it's not a problem if you're fine but I would I would as you've just said really it's like urge you to just look a bit deeper and 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 think about it because it doesn't have to be a problem, but could it be better? Or could it actually be a hidden thing that's responsible for something else that is, is a niggle that you, you're trying to overcome, but you haven't considered sleep as a potential pathway to mm. overcoming that other, other concern? Yeah. And I mean, it's not as black and white either, is it, as they're a good sleeper or they're a bad sleeper? No, because if all, you, all no. you need to all you need to do to prove that argument is to as as a as an adult think about your own sleep even if you're the kind of person who generally doesn't experience sleep issues or sleep sleep troubles you will sometimes and it doesn't mean that you don't feel tired it doesn't mean that you wouldn't benefit from a bit more sleep or perhaps changing up the timings of your sleep i mean adults as a rule are terrible with their sleep routine and their sleep hygiene even if they say oh i'm asleep as soon as my head hits the pillow doesn't mean they don't that's wake up. not necessarily a good thing <laughs> no and mm. does it doesn't necessarily mean that they don't then wake up feeling tired or struggling to get going or yeah. having to have quite a big dose of caffeine to get their to get themselves functioning in the morning you know we the only difference with adults and children is adults can take the stimulants they need to get themselves through the day, like caffeine. You know, we don't recommend that children consume those things. And so they, they have to experience their sleep deprivation in, in a much more pure way, I think. But, yeah, you know, it's yeah. not about are they good or bad? It's are they no. getting enough? Are they sleeping well enough for them? Is it serving them? Is it serving them? Are they thriving or are they getting yeah. by? Mm. Mm. And it's so overlooked, so overlooked. And I think Very even so. you know, parents, so um, my, my children are, um, you know, tween and teenage now. And I, I see so many um, things that happen with kiddies their age. And I just think, oh, my gosh. But I don't, you know, I'm not judging, but the parents don't know any different. And, I, and I, you know, I, I have gone past the um, idea now of like, oh, maybe we're a bit strict with our kids. My children appreciate and value their sleep they'll happily take themselves off, you know, they're not trying to push for the late nights because they know and, and feel the benefits of good sleep because it's been instilled in them for so long. Um, but, you know, it's the, even adults that say to me, oh, I don't need that much sleep, I, I get by. I'm like, mm -hmm. it won't be without negative consequences, if not now, later in life, and ones you probably can't see yet. So we'll, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> but, you have to want that change or you have to want that improvement much like I always use physical analogies like much like exercise and nutrition you have to want the outcome of making changes there otherwise you won't do it so we could yeah. absolutely talk about this all day we really but bringing could. it back to those parents that are listening I, I, I want to wrap up just by saying you know Becky I love that you've shared with us your journey you've gone from um I, I well in summary somebody who thought that sleep training was a negative thing that you didn't ever want to do anything like that with your child to complete convert um not just because it transformed your life which it did but because you have a new level of intellect around what it means how it works how it's completely bespoke that it mm. isn't just a prescribed thing that you know, like a book like Ferber where you go, oh, you follow this. It's like, no, these are human beings, the parents as well as, and the caregivers, as well as the, the child that we're talking about. It's a 
it's a team effort it's a combination there's nothing wrong with a the child they're not yeah. broken you don't need to fix them you just need to shift the way that you parent around sleep so that it can be better for, and you like obviously learn all of this and then gone on to want to make a difference in the world become a sleep consultant and you've yourself now paid it forward and transformed hundreds of lives doing the same um which i just think is an incredible story to share so thank you for coming and sharing that how can people find you if they're like she gets me and this is the <laughs> lady i need to talk to which is exactly she is my person felt. she is my person i want to speak to this becky she yeah. yeah how can people find you well i think i want to say one more thing which yeah, has please. been in my head the whole time you were saying all of that and Go if i could summarize in one sentence my experience and my journey it's that sleep training made me a better parent. I love that. Um, I'm on Instagram. <laughs> My handle is <clears throat> at Sleep Nanny Becky Brightman, all one word. Uh, I'm also on Facebook. We'll link that as well. Yeah. We'll link also that on there. Facebook. Yeah. You can find me on Facebook the same way as Instagram, Sleep Nanny Becky Brightman. Um, yeah. DM her, fine. people. Send you can her a DM message. Me. You can DM she me. She will chat with you. I will. WhatsApp me, yeah. DM me um, on Instagram. Thank you so Come much. Come and have a chat. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. There's never any judgment, and I love it. We will, you know, Becky will happily chat with you. Um, and, sh you know, you don't have to be ready to go. Just have a chat. Stand it out. That's yeah. Great. Yeah. And actually, mm -hmm. it will be, it will be, it will be easier <laughs> It'll be yeah. easier for you if you do it sooner rather than later. Definitely. So don't Usually wait. It's only manifest. Yeah. Yeah. They do. Becky, thank you so much. It's thank been an you. absolute pleasure to have this conversation with you. And I know we have many more ahead of us. So I will be welcoming you back to the show. But thank you so, so much. You're so welcome. Thank you. Take care. Bye.